Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Yusofia, where minds meet online. And tonight, uh, we're going to meet with a distant uh, and always close friend of mine, Marcel Proust. Marcel Proust, uh, because of the incredible number of editions that he was um, printed in, uh, is in many stations of my life spread all over the house you know in uh, in French there's a edition with 10 books I don't know why uh, there's one edition of the Pleiad with uh, one book but 4,000 pages in English there's uh, two volumes 10 volumes no stand no two volumes seven volumes the book itself was originally uh huh, okay uh was originally actually written as one book uh when Marcel Proust started writing he had no idea what he's going to be doing he did not start writing a book he started writing for the sake of writing. Let's go and tell a little bit of the story of uh, Marcel Proust because it will help us to understand who the guy was and how come that such an incredible piece of work came out, uh, when it came out, how it came out, and what it does to us today and what it doesn't succeed in doing to us today. Uh, well, Marcel Proust is uh, a week older than I am. He was born uh, July 10th. Uh, well, uh, about uh, 71 years before I was born. He was born in 1975. Now, let's see who is fast with mathematics. Um, and uh, he had a very, very normal childhood, normal for a very wealthy family. He comes from a very, very wealthy uh, French family, a family that in other times would have been aristocracy, but because this was the end of the 19th century in France, aristocrats were talked about, but not mentioned really. So it's not uh, as if there were du Proust, their name was Proust, and then, you know, he went to school and everything was okay, and then the miracle happened, then the thing happened that changed his life, and many would say changed literature. When he was nine years old, going on to ten, he had an attack of asthma, now, we don't have enough information how serious or severe the attack was, but it was enough for his doting, loving parents uh, to decide, aha, Marcel is somebody with a weakness, and we have to give him all the chances to live a normal life. And what is a normal life for a rich and, I would say, lazy boy? not to go to school, to do whatever he feels like doing, and um, just lead a life of uh, a very lovely, friendly, willing-to-help parasite. Uh, he never had the drive to do anything so to speak, to help society. But, on the other hand, he was very charismatic, very nice to everybody. Uh, one of the most terrifying notes I read is by a guy called Alain de Bouton. Uh, probably people know his name. Uh, he's a guy who made a lot of money, is still making a lot of money, of turning philosophy and literature into... Uh, something like the Reader's Digest, you know, giving summaries of uh, uh, you don't want to read the whole book, no problem. I'll give you the gist of it. And uh, he 
uh, Alain de Bouton uh, wrote uh, this uh, the line defining uh, uh, Marcel Proust the art of being lazy and the art of being a lazy genius but uh, ah and of course another thing he said Marcel Proust was so nice that his concierge at one point thought she was his best friend now I don't know how to eat a phrase like that sounds terrible to me but anyhow um, so you know his life was easy going he was not by any stretch of the imagination um, a brilliant um, a brilliant man in no way I mean you know like every wealthy child he played the piano um, he never showed any incredible uh, talent in playing the piano uh, he wrote a couple of things when he was 19 he wrote uh, he started writing essays and uh, uh, critiques but they were cute nothing more uh, there was nothing uh, there was no sign that this guy is going to be the incredible writer that he became um, he met with friends he was nice with friends he was all over town uh, he had in his group of friends uh, a lot of things happened and uh, from what we will learn later in the book he became a voyeur he became somebody who looked at life in a very sympathetic way but rather looked at life instead of participating in life um, in the group of friends it was the thing of rigueur uh, not to be too particular uh, about the kind of uh, sexual relationship you had and uh, you were not a homosexual if you also had homosexual relationship you were just an open human being but in the group of friends uh, there were some homosexuals you know that and uh, we will see later on in the book that um, he goes into the relationship of homosexuals uh, many many people thought that he himself was homosexual uh, but he was probably not uh, his best friend became his bed but his bed became his boudoir his bed became his castle and he almost never left his bed what happened when he was 35 years old mama died his mother died and then all of a sudden his life changed completely he closed himself in the house more and more he built uh, a kind of a mausoleum to himself to his living self within his bedroom all the walls were covered with cork so that the noises would not come in uh, which is a good idea for uh, I, I guess for a recording studio but he had no idea about recording what he wanted to do is to uh, really shut himself out of the world and uh, slowly slowly he started living in the past the good name to call the work of uh, uh, Marcel Proust I mean his life work because he wrote other things quite nice but the, his life work 
was obviously à la recherche de temps perdu. The early translation into English, I think, gives us a better idea of what this is all about. Membrance of things past. Because what uh, Marcel Proust is doing here, he breaks away from the day-to-day -day life. He decides there's nothing to live for. And what he does is he creates a fantastic picture book of the things that he lived through. He does not exactly call his uh, protagonist Marcel. He calls him Swan for different reasons which we will go into, but they're not that important. Swan is not Marcel Proust, but he's somebody who lives the same kind of life that Proust lived from the time that he found out about his uh, excuse for being me uh, okay can you hear me now yeah you can hear me now okay uh, this is my fault I turned my microphone off what did you miss well how can we know <laughs> well of course you can know. one minute one minute I think okay uh, well basically I was just saying that uh, the in in a in the way similar to Robert Musil, whose work outlived him, because Robert Musil's work found its way to being published almost twenty years after his death. With Marcel Proust, it was not that bad because Marcel Proust did not leave 20 different uh, endings to a book. He finished the book, only it was not published until 1927. Uh, he died about four years earlier. Uh, so we have here seven books. And uh, just to give you an idea how important this book is. Uh, you know that uh, the Bible being obviously uh, the best-selling book of all times is also an excuse for uh, some people call it intelligent I call it a little bit of a useless quiz and every year there's an international Bible quiz and people come from all over the world to Israel 
to prove how much they know about the Bible. And basically, it's the kind of knowledge that uh, we are trying to fight at Usofia because it's not knowledge, it's information. No insight, just know it by heart. And uh, and every time there's a, there's a new genius uh, from some kind of mm-hmm. a strange country or from Israel or whatever, and uh, they know 80% of the Bible by heart and blah, 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 blah. Mo- the book à la recherche du temps perdu has the same kind of of following and it also creates a very interesting quiz that uh, well sadly enough is not taking place anymore but I'm going to show you now the last edition of this quiz and please pay attention it's uh, much better than any trivia you can think of Uh, try to find out if you read the book if you can come up with the answers I'm calling here uh, some friend of ours and they are led by a guy called John Cleese and uh, they're going to show us the last quiz that ever happened about the work of Mr. Marcel Proust, also known to friends as Marcel Proust. Good evening and welcome to the Arthur Ludlow Memorial Baths Newport for this year's finals of the All England Summarised Proust competition. As you may remember, each contestant has to give a brief summary of Proust's à la recherche du temps perdu, once in a swimsuit and once in evening dress. The field is now narrowed to three finalists and your judges tonight are... Alec and Eric Betzer, ex-Surrey cricketers, Stuart Surridge, ex-captain of Surrey, Omar Sharif, Laurie Fishlock, ex-Surrey opening batsman, Peter May, the former Surrey and England captain, and Yehudi Menuhin, the world-famous violinist and the president of the Surrey Cricket Club. And right now, it's time to meet your host for tonight, Arthur Mee! And welcome! Klaus could say, la malade imaginaire de recondition et de toute surveillance et bientôt la même chose. <laughs> Remember, each contestant this evening has a maximum of 15 seconds to summarize à la recherche du temps perdu. And only Proust over there, you can see exactly how far he gets. <laughs> so let's crack straight on with our first contestant tonight. He's last year's semi-finalist from Luton, Mr. Harry Bannard. <laughs> Spot! You know the summarizing spot? 15 seconds from now! Klaus Knobel, the sentence that tells us that the irrevocability of time lost, the forfeiture of innocence through experience, the reinstallment of, of extra temporal values of time regained. Ultimately, the novel is both optimistic and separate in the context of a humane religious experience, restating as it does the concept of intemporality. In the first volume, Swan, the family friend. Oh, I well, tried, Harry. <laughs> He chose a general appraisal of the work before getting onto the story. And as you can see, he only got as far as page one of Swan's Way, the first of the seven <laughs> volumes. A good try, though, and very nice posture. Harry Baggett, you're from Luton? Yes, sir, here you are. Now, Harry, what made you first want to try and start summarising Proust? Well, I first entered a seaside summarising Proust competition when I was on holiday in Bournemouth, and my doctor encouraged me with it. And, Harry, oh, what are your hobbies outside summarising? Well, uh, strangling animals, golf and masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Harry Baggett. Well, there he goes, Harry Baggett. He must have let himself down a bit on the hobbies. Golf's not very popular around here. <laughs> Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mr. Rutherford from Leicester. Are you, are you ready, Ronald? Yeah. Right, that's a summarising spot. Right. You've got 15 seconds from now. Uh, oh. Uh, that's Sol, Sol. Uh, 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 there's this house, there's this house. Uh, and... Uh, it's in the morning, it's in the morning. No, 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 it's in the evening, it's in the evening. Uh, and, and there's a garden. Uh, and uh, this block comes in, block comes in. Uh, what's his name? What's his name? Oh, God, just said it, just said it. Big block. Uh, swan, Swan! <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and now, ladies 
and gentlemen, I'd like you to welcome the last of our All England finalists this evening from Bingley, the Bolton Choral Society, and their leader, Superintendent McGough. <laughs> All right, Bingley, remember you've got 15 seconds to summarise the crowds in their entirety, starting from now. Proust in his first book wrote about, wrote about, he 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 I don't think uh, any of our contestants this evening have succeeded in encapsulating the intricacies of Proust's masterwork. So I'm going to award the first prize this evening to the girl with the biggest tits. <laughs> Okay, well, that was one try at uh, the uh, quiz of uh, trying to tell the story of Proust, but it's not so much the difficulty of trying to tell the story of Proust, uh, or uh, the story of uh, A la recherche du temps perdu, it's uh, the incredible difficulty of actually getting the book open. And um, this is something that is. Uh, it, I must. I must uh, share with you uh, a problem that is now being researched by many scientists from all over the world. Uh, the difficulty, the inborn difficulty, of moving the cover of the book in a way to open it now. Uh, we will do some exercises here. You see, almost every book you take, you just open it up and you can leave through it and uh, the words kind of jump up at you and they hit your face and you read beautiful lines like, uh, but why not do as well as say, paint these just as they are, careless, what comes of it? Robert Browning, just open it up anywhere. We'll take another book. Difficult, heavy, Aeschylus, Antigone. Still, we can open up the book, start reading, and start understanding. What happened to us when we meet with our friend Marcel Proust? Well, first of all, we don't meet with him because the book is gone. You can hardly find it. You find it in uh, second-hand books, prime condition, never opened. You can see they're still in plastic or whatever. And uh, even if the book is 50 years old, it looks new because it is new. Nobody ever opened it. So I'm going to give you, first of all, a couple of uh, little tips on how to go about it. I don't know what happened to my little uh, thing here, but it kind of uh, got mixed up. So the first time... I uh, read uh, the, um, A la recherche de temps perdu. I shouldn't say the first time I read it, but the first time I actually finished it. Because uh, I tried and I started to read it uh, more than once, obviously. And then one time, I, 70 days after I started reading it, 
I was looking for the lost time that I didn't realize actually got lost while I was reading the book. So let me give you a couple of tips how to go about it. The first thing is you have to think that literature, like any other academic um, discipline, has holy cows, and you're not supposed to touch holy cows. Holy cows are supposed to stay on the shelves, collect dust, and be the uh, theme for PhD projects. Nothing else. You're not supposed to read them, you're not supposed to understand them, and you're not supposed even to know more than you need to know in order to write 75,000 pages as a PhD thesis. Make sure that they are written in such a way that nobody can understand it and everybody is going to be afraid to say that you are talking rubbish and uh, because your language is so difficult and complex that people will think that you're very very smart and will grant you a PhD and then your job will be to make sure that the holy cows stay closed, hammered, nailed to the shelves of academia and that nobody opens them up and reads them. What happened to me with uh, as uh, Monty Python would say, with Mr. Proust, or Proust, was that I actually enjoyed the book. I finished the book, and uh, I found myself immediately elated to, to a point where I, I thought, is it possible that this is the book that everybody was telling us is so difficult to read? And uh, what I'd like to do before we go any further is to read you a couple of quotes from the book, if I can get this the right way. Okay, here we are. Uh, book two, as I say, uh, it was written in seven books. Just listen to each and every one of the phrases and you'll understand that uh, this is not a book to be read as a novel. Uh, this is a book to be read and enjoyed and uh, take it leave it whenever you want. Take this sentence from book 2, page 282. I'm talking here about the English uh, translation. Uh, okay. One becomes moral as soon as one is unhappy. This is a line that we can find at Musil, we can find uh, with Kohelet, uh, we can find even with Sren Kierkegaard. Uh, when we are in love, our love is too big a thing for us to be able to contain it within ourselves. It radiates towards the loved ones, finds there a surface which arrests it, forcing it to return to its starting point and it is this repercussions of our own feelings which we call the other's feelings and which charms us more than on its outward journey because we do not recognize it as having originated in ourselves. What, what, what is he doing here? He's doing nothing. He lies in bed for 20 years, Marcel Proust spent his life in his room, almost not leaving his room at all, and uh, spending all his time doing nothing else but writing. Uh, 
book like this is something that some tips first thing you want to do is decide whether you want to buy it in one volume uh, in English it runs to something like 4,000 pages in uh, if you go in one volume in French it's about 2,400 pages although the famous Pleiade uh, has an edition of again close to 4,000 pages I would suggest take it in the seven books it'll be very nice to roam the seven books next to your bed uh, in your living room where you have the comfortable chair to sit down and enjoy or if we go to uh, Marat if you remember Mr. Marat from uh, the French Revolution the guy who had a problem and had to be in his bath all the time uh, he missed by some 200 years the possibility of having Proust lined out next to his bathroom uh, he would have had a much better time reading that instead of trying to and maybe uh, he would be able to engage Charlotte Corday in a conversation about Proust and uh, still be with us today. Uh, well, maybe not with us today, but live a little bit longer. So, get the seven the volumes and put them in a place where you feel comfortable, where you want to be. Now, For a week, don't tell your friends, don't tell your colleagues at work, don't tell your wife, don't tell your husband, don't tell your kids, don't tell anybody, and just every day pass 5, 10, 20 minutes, let it grow to an hour, and just look at the books and think, hmm, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Familiarize yourself with the concept that you're going to go on a journey, and a very, very particular journey. Uh, I would say the journey will take you about 70 days. So it's much shorter than what it took uh, Jules Verne to go around the world. Well, not that much shorter, but a little bit shorter. So, create yourself in that one week, create for yourself your free time. In the meantime, while you're creating your field time, fill it up with things that you hate. I don't know, uh, if you hate watching football, uh, fill it up by watching football for 10 minutes. And then you'll say, okay, well, that's a terrible way of wasting my time. I must find some be something better. Um, if you hate reading newspapers, read a newspaper for 20 minutes and, say, and just throw it away and say, that's a terrible way of wasting time. And here you have now 30 minutes of free time to dedicate to something else. And this way you'll create the right amount of time to dedicate to that book for the next coming 70, I would say, about 70 days. Let's see now, once you have all that going for yourself, uh, read a little bit about Marcel Proust. Uh, you'll find that Marcel Proust was a very, very friendly man, much friendlier than uh, people today think he was. He was very charismatic, he was nice to everybody, he was trying to do favors to people, until the famous time where he decided, okay, I live my life, everything is finished, 
I don't have anything new to do, and now I'm going to clothe myself in my mausoleum with corks around the walls and just recollect what I did until now so that I can reconstruct the life for you to enjoy. When we get to the point where we understand that we have finished the search for the lost time that we are dedicating every day to things that we don't really want to do. Uh, as I say, watching uh, football, reading the newspaper, uh, walking the dog. Uh, no, walking the dog is nice. Um, and now comes another nice... Football is also nice. Big pun? Football is also nice. <laughs> okay, fine. I mean, uh, I, I'm here, you have to be uh, very creative and not trust anybody else. You have to create your own list of things you hate to do, but you still do. Uh, give me an idea. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll add it to my hated things. You're not going to give me an idea. No, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Now, once we finished the search of the available time of leisure, uh, I would suggest that we do our first jump into the book. And we will start to uh, feed ourselves with reading a certain chapter of the book for a certain period of time and allow ourselves to fall asleep with it. Now, we all know that the book starts with... I thought I brought it with me. I guess I'll have to go and bring it because I thought it was here. Well, bear with me for a minute. I'll go walk the dog, read the newspaper, find some free time. I'll be back in a second. Excuse me just a second. Okay. We lost Holger for a minute. We'll just uh, wait and allow Holger to come back. Okay, here we are. I guess you made the list, Holger, of the things that you can uh, 
try not doing that you're doing now to <laughs> liberate time to read uh, uh, A La Recherche. <clears throat> I have here uh, one of the older editions of the uh, of the book in English. It's uh, the Random House uh, publication, which comes out in two uh, volumes. Uh, it first came out in 1931, uh, but now we have, uh, I guess, it, it, it still comes out in this kind of uh, volume. Now, I will just read you the beginning to get the feeling of what is going to happen to you in the first time that you actually succeed in doing this, which is opening the book. Don't forget, you are in your bed, you are in the uh, most comfortable chair in the house or in your bath. You are relaxed. Swan's Way, the overture. For a long time I used to go to bed early. Sometimes when I had put out my candle, my eyes would close so quickly that I had not even time to say, I'm going to sleep. And half an hour later, the thought that it was time to go to sleep would actually awaken me. I would try to put away the book, which I imagined was still in my hand, and to blow out the light. I had been thinking all the time while I was asleep of what I had just been reading, but my thoughts had run into a channel of their own, until I myself seemed actually to have become the subject of my book, a church, a quartet, the rivalry between François Premier and Charles V. This impression would persist for some moment after I was awake. It did not disturb my mind, but it lay like scales upon my eyes and prevented them from registering the fact that the candle was no longer burning. Then it would begin to seem unintelligible as the thoughts of a former existent must be to a reincarnate spirit. The subject of my book would separate itself from me, leaving me free to choose whether I would form part of it or not, and at the same time my sight would return and I would be astonished to find myself actually in a state of darkness, pleasant and restful enough for the eyes, and even more perhaps for the mind, to which it appeared incomprehensible without a cause, a matter dark indeed. Ah, he was... Okay, so Holger was watching football. Uh, that's uh, that's good. Here we get the feeling immediately. What what is Proust doing here in in these first opening lines of the book? And I think it's 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 quite. It's quite a, 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 an achievement. He takes us away from anything that is happening really. It takes us away from telling us a story. There's no narrative. We are with him, next to him, and the guy wakes up in the middle of the night, and he wakes up before he really realizes that he actually fell to sleep. And uh, 
we immediately start to understand what this book is going to be about. First of all, he talks about, am I going to write the book or not? Am I the book? Or am I reading the book that I'm not going to write? But the most interesting thing that happens here is that he breaks the borders. He breaks open the dam for the water to flow, the water of the imagination. Because uh, what he says here is, My thoughts had run into a channel of their own without taking into consideration what I was reading about, my thoughts go in a completely different way. And all of a sudden, I'm together with Francois Premier and Charles V. And how many times does it happen to us that we read something, we fall, to sleep, we fall asleep, we wake up in the morning, and we have those um, kind of uh, not very clear thoughts. What did we read? What happened to us? And those not very clear thoughts sometimes come from the book, sometimes come from our mind. And this is exactly this non-clear uh, passage of time that Marcel Proust puts us in immediately at the beginning of the book. Again, he does not start with telling us a story. He starts with telling us a non-story. For a long time I used to go to bed early. Sometimes when I put out my candle, my eyes would close so quickly that I had not even time to say, I'm going to sleep. How many times do we say to ourselves, I fell asleep so fast that I'm not even, uh, I don't even have the time to say to myself, I am going to sleep? Normally, it's something that we say about our bad partner. How many times did it happen? I, I, at least I can talk to my about myself that uh, you know uh, the my bad partner would say, mm, "Today I have a difficulty falling asleep, not finishing the sentence and being asleep." Uh, and here we start now understanding that Marcel Proust has a bad companion, and this bad companion is going to be Swan. Uh, so he immediately creates the duplicity of the two characters, Swan and Marcel. Swan becomes the neighbor of Marcel. Uh, Christina Thoma gave a like on the Proust even on fan page and now is I guess she's on the website I think she doesn't know or want to join told me okay uh, thank you uh, Andre uh, obviously we have a problem here that uh, people have a problem about joining us, have a problem about understanding that to join us you actually need to uh, be on the web. And uh, But it, it's something that we will solve uh, with time. Um, first of all, I would like us to think about the time that uh, the work was written, what happened in Europe in the beginning of the 20th century or the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, all the, um, I don't know if to call it revolutions, but definitely the very harsh evolutions of the appreciation of art. Um, let us think about what happened in music. And here we have, uh, you know, Debussy, Saint-Saëns. A little bit later, we have the introduction of uh, 
uh, forêt. Uh, what happened? Musical narrative became different. Musical timing became different. What ha what is happening in paintings? The old concept of having the um, perspective as a main point of art. You know, if we think about Dürer uh, in his paintings as a spectator that allows us to understand the picture through the eyes of somebody from within the picture and this way giving us the possibility to be a mirror that looks into the picture through the eyes of somebody within the picture but also creating the perspective uh, Donatello telling us that if you put something small in a picture next to something big the something small is deep deep inside what happened at the end of the 19th century the beginning of the 20th century things kind of flattened out the narrative was killed the narrative did not develop according to a timeline but the narrative kind of was glued one next to the other and it was up to the interactive and proactive spectator and reader to make sense out of participating in the work of art. The work of art became a work of participation. Let's take Cezanne. Cezanne paintings did not finish with Cezanne. Cezanne paintings were on the paper calling for the spectator to say hey you make me feel something and the spectator had to answer to the painting what he feels if we take the famous Le Demoiselle de Avignon in and by themselves it's a closed picture that almost says nothing. If we don't allow ourselves to interact with the painting, to talk with the painting, the painting is there and we are here. Ulysses, James Joyce Ulysses. If we try to read James Joyce, Joyce Ulysses the first, at the same time and the same way that we enjoyed reading um, from uh, Don Quixote to uh, La Divina Commedia to all the other books that came before or the Bible we are looking for a narrative to take us by the hand and walk us through the book and Ulysses says aha uh -huh, there's no narrative nobody's going to take you by the hand you have to dive into the book and find your interaction with the things that do or do not happen you make up your mind whether the, the things do or do not happen the same thing we can say obviously about Musil if you read Musil you go you dive into Musil you can stop on each and every page and spend as much time as you want with one paragraph and allow that paragraph to engulf you and become a friend of yours and tell you things now nobody really does it better and to a greater extent than Monsieur Marcel Proust does in his first book. And I'm talking about uh, Swan's Way. In Swan's Way, Marcel Proust finds himself in a place he never dreamed he could be. In other words, 
he is not writing a book. He allows the book to happen. And he is there in his bedroom. In this Now, try to imagine this room. A bedroom. A place where for the last 35 years, the guy was 35 years when he started creating this mausoleum to himself. 35 years when his mother died. For 35 years, this is the room where he used to come to sleep, read a book, blow out the candle, close his eyes, go into uh, the dementia of sleep, or whatever you want to call it, wake up in the morning, wash, go out, the room stayed there. All of a sudden, the room doesn't go any place, and he doesn't go any place. And he creates to himself this mausoleum of cork, Everything is completely closed to the outside. And all of a sudden, a miracle starts happening. The book becomes reality, much more reality than any reality that he is living through, because his only reality is he lies in bed. Uh, if we look at the picture here that I put this is not uh, Marcel Proust in a cafe this is Marcel Proust in bed with a cup of coffee and of course the famous Madeleine that he would put into the coffee and it will take five pages to explain what happens to the Madeleine the, the piece of uh, uh, um, cake the kind of a uh, brioche that uh, he breaks up, looks at, and allows the coffee to go into this piece of Madeleine. And there are so many cafes around the world and restaurants called the Madeleine as a homage to the Madeleine of uh, Marcel Proust. But The miracle that happened to Proust in that room was that the room, the, the book started to have a life of its own. And when a book has a life of its own, we will see it uh, later on. And here I want to introduce uh, the concept of, of, of the whole series. Uh, we are going to try and uh, intertext. Are you familiar with the concept of uh, intertextuality? In other words, trying to understand the text through other texts? Um, I'm, I'm going to try and take Vertigo, Hitchcock's Vertigo. In Hitchcock's Vertigo, we find out at one point that there's a story being told without us knowing about the story. There's a story being lived without us knowing. Are you familiar with the film? Did you see the movie? You did not see the movie. Uh, by all means, go to see the movie. It's a very, very interesting and philosophically interesting movie. Uh, there are many, many layers in the movie. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, okay, let's go to Homer. Are you familiar with Homer, the uh, the Odyssey? What happened with the Odyssey? There's no way that anybody would spend over 10 years going from Troy uh, back to Ithaca, which, uh, you know, if you swim, it would take you 30 days if you're a slow swimmer. Uh and here we have this very uh, canny man, uh, the guy who invented the first uh, tank. You know, if you look at the Trojan horse, it's the first tank. Uh, it, it brings soldiers into the field of, of war. And here we are, this guy completely lost in the middle of nowhere. 
Why is he completely lost? Because there are a lot of inter-stories. And I'm trying to see how we can use what Homer did with Odysseus and see what Proust proposes to do with uh, Swan. Swan goes on a journey very similar to the journey that uh, Heinrich goes in uh, The Man Ohne Eigenschaften, The Man uh, Without Qualities. In other words, it's a journey that takes a long time and covers no space. It's the same kind of concept as the journey of uh, uh, Odysseus. The journey of Odysseus makes much more sense of suffering to the people who are not with Odysseus. Penelope. Penelope has to live through a life of, uh, uh, well, some kind of suffering, having to uh, do something during the day and undo it at night, having to uh, see her household uh, wealthy and everything, lose everything because uh, she's so beautiful and so many people want to marry her that they kind of come every day for a, a, a party and eat practically everything that is in the house. Uh, and here we have Swan living if we look at it through the eyes of Homer, as we don't have the eyes of Hitchcock available because you didn't see the movie, but if we look at it through the eyes of Homer, Swan has 4,000 pages to find his Ithaca. But he started off in Ithaca. We know his Ithaca. His Ithaca is explained right in the beginning and the beginning like an opera is not called anything else but overture and the overture shows us where it starts and it no it makes no secret of where it's going to come at the end it's going to come back to the bedroom so we start in the bedroom we will come back to the bedroom many many times but at the end 4,000 pages later he will find his Penelope his Telemachus uh, he will have the fights with the uh, uh, with the uh, um, lotus eaters and everything else and we'll see how Homer when he talks to Marcel Proust, whispers in his ears, I don't know, I mean, Homer was supposed to be blind, so maybe instead of whispering into his ears, he whispers into his coffee to blow the coffee so the coffee is not too hot. But he shows Marcel Proust the way to break up the laws of the narrative that... Marcel Proust, to extent, plays with. And here's a secret. <clears throat> if you read Marcel Proust as a collection of anecdotes, as a collection of smart phrases that don't lead to a story, that are not trying to impress you with the titans that are not trying to impress you. Think about Homer. Think about Odysseus. Think about this guy who is everything but a hero. He did not want to go to the war. He was uh, uh, actually forced into going to the war because otherwise he would have he would have had to kill his own son, which. Uh, he didn't do. And uh, the same thing here with uh, Marcel Proust. He is thrown into the fight with trying to write a book 
without having to tell a story, but having fun writing the book, having fun living with the book, which is something that I would like to offer to you to do with us over the next uh, series, and try to find the fun of the intelligence of the book. And uh, I'm going to read some more of the quotes from the book. Uh, we are now in uh, a book two again. Uh, book two, just to remind everybody, is called uh, Within a Budding Grove, Within uh, a Wood. In page number 252, we have the soldier is convinced that a certain interval of time capable of being indefinitely prolonged will be allowed before the bullet finds him. This is during the beginning of First World War. This book came out in 1913. The thief, before he is caught, man in general, before they have to die, that is the amulet which preserves people and sometimes peoples not from the danger but from the fear of danger in reality from the belief in danger which in certain cases allows them to brave it without actually needing to be brave it is confidence of this sort and with as little foundation that sustains the lover who is counting on a reconciliation on a letter. For me to cease to expect a reconciliation, it would have sufficed that I should have ceased to wish for one. You can see here the amount of time, thought, and fun that a man that has no pressing matters can inject into the sense of life. And then in book number four, which is the uh, Guamantes way, we find a fantastic line. The mistress whom I have loved most passionately have never coincided with my love from them so what I suggest as we come to the end of this first series is first of all try to go through the ritual that I suggested. Forget that Marcel Proust is Marcel Proust. Forget that A la Recherche de Temps Perdu is A la Recherche de, uh, to find reasons not to read it. And I always uh, try to say with The Man Without Qualities, Ulysses, uh, other books who are holy cows, sacred cows, you can open them up and read wherever you want. Don't do it with Proust. With Proust, go according to the pages. But take your time. If the first day you want to read two paragraphs, one paragraph, do just that. The first time I read Proust, I fell in love with the first paragraph. I mean, it was incredible, you know. I, 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 I closed my eyes and I saw this guy in his bed with his book and uh, he's trying to make up his mind whether he actually blew out his candle before he fell asleep or he fell asleep, woke up, found out that the candle was blown out, 
didn't remember whether he blew it out or not, and it was a fantastic mind game for me. And I read this first paragraph two, three, four times before I could go on. And I found myself after that saying, hmm, I don't want to go on. I want to stay with this without the book. And I closed the book and stayed with it. And I think this is a good way to try and enjoy Proust for yourself. Not so that in the next social gathering you can say, hey, I read Marcel Proust. Having said that, I wish a really and joyful reading and a lot of fun with uh, Marcel Proust uh, over the next meetings we will find those uh, real stories of fun real fun passages where you can sit and laugh was nice versa for me I loved Magic Mountain Man only Eigenschaften, but I read the first paragraph of Recherche and thought I couldn't stand seven volumes. Don't don't go through the seven volumes. Forget that there are seven volumes. Let it happen. You know, uh, well, I don't know uh, in, uh, you know, in uh, The Mann ohne Eigenschaften, uh, how many times, I, I, and I'm talking about myself, how many times did you stop and say, I don't want to lose this moment. Uh, you know, when when he meets Agatha, I, I didn't want to be with them. I, I wanted them to finish their business and call me when they're finished and then I'll come back. And there, some, there were some passages where I just didn't want to leave the book. I wanted to stay and read it again and again and again because, you know, in Marcel Proust, in that way is similar, but of you know, uh, Musil is a story on its own, and uh, uh, the uh, Zauberberg is a story on its own. Zauberberg is is again, it's not so much a narrative as it's a fantastic essay that doesn't leave you alone for one second and it keeps shooting wisdom at you and the wisdom is also very very interesting you know Settembrini all of a sudden inventing the Italian uh, communism before Italy before communism was was around uh, so all those books obviously have something else but I'm going to be a little bit, uh, please don't tell anybody else. Uh, in what we saw from Monty Python, the uh, hobby of the first uh, uh, idiot who lost immediately, uh, his hobby, one of his hobbies was masturbating. Uh, I think Proust's hobby is masturbating. Now, it's not a very joyful uh, thing to talk about uh, or do or whatever but if we take that away and we just allow ourselves our rhythm with Proust we will find A. it's not a, a book you have to finish you know uh Marilyn Monroe was caught red-handed with a terrible book, Ulysses, in her hands. And she was asked by the photographer, this is Ulysses by James Joyce. I mean, do you enjoy reading it? And she says, I have no idea whether I enjoy or don't enjoy. But whenever I feel low, I open it up, read 15 pages, and it pulls me up, and I feel good. So... Uh, Proust is not that kind of a book. Proust is, book, is a book that does want you to follow the very slow pace 
of somebody who is trying to recapture his life and refuses to live it. These are the main things that we have to remember. This guy refuses to live. At 35, he says, whatever I did, that's it. You know, it's, it's, it's a closed circle. But I'm going to play it again and again and again and again. Uh, you know, and I'm going to play it randomly. I'll take an event from here and an event from there. And that allows for a lot of insight, but it also allows for a lot of fun. Now, if you can find that aperture into the book, you'll enjoy it. Again, uh, you know, uh, Musil is one of those books you can open up wherever you want and read a sense of wisdom that can ser serve you for life wherever you open it up. Probably more than Nietzsche in, uh, in certain... Uh, but for the maybe La Gaia Scienza, uh, die fröhliche uh, Wissenschaft, where in the beginning you have all those uh, little anecdotic uh, poems, so to speak, which give a, uh, a sense. Uh, in search of uh, time lost, or as the first uh, translation into English, which is a good idea, remembrance of things past. We have to understand that this is not a book that tells a story. This is a book that tries to bring back life as it was lived and tries not to participate in that life. That's why I say that Swan and Marcel are very close, but they're, they're not the same person. Marcel is dead. And he sends Swan to try out his life through different eyes. And that's why I would like to introduce the eyes of Homer and the eyes of Zeno and the eyes of Hitchcock and many, many others to try and find out intertextually how we can read the life of Swan through other eyes, because this is what Proust is trying to do. He's trying to read his own life when he decided that he lives no more, that he decided that he's going to be buried in that room until one of two things happen, or he finishes writing, or he finishes his life. And as it happened, he finished writing and his life before the book actually became uh, a whole, you know, before 1927, he died earlier than the book came out. Well, uh, thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, I hope that uh, you can have time to get the seven volumes and put them next to your bed and look at them for a while. Uh, and if you have a cat that plays with the book, that's good. And if you have a book, a uh, dog that eats part of the book, maybe he finds in it something that we did not. Uh, we will be again with uh, Proust in two weeks, and in two weeks' time what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, project parts of vertigo of Hitchcock and read into it parts of A la recherche du temps perdu. If there are any ideas that you would like to add, uh, obviously I'm, I'd be very glad to introduce them into our next meeting. Anything you would like to say before we Kiss everybody good night. Thank you. That's a good saying. <laughs> okay. That's very interesting, really. I enjoyed I enjoyed a lot. Okay. Uh thank you very much again for being with us here at uh, Usofia where times 
uh, allow minds to be online and to meet online and to exchange ideas. And uh, one thing that I would like to really achieve, and that will be probably in series number four of Proust or of anything else, is to allow us for an interactive and proactive uh, enjoy of a book, of, of a text, and uh, kind of break the frontal and sit back situation that we have now. But we will allow it to happen uh, because otherwise it, 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 it'll be academia again where the professor says, okay, now it's you, you talk. So uh, thank you very much and uh, I have really enjoyed it. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Swan. Thank you, Nira. Thank you, Holger. Thank you, Andre. And uh, hopefully next time we will fill the pages of Proust with so many more minds. Good night from you, Sophia. Where minds meet online. See you next time.